usually I wear two pieces. It makes it so easy. You don't care, you don't care that you just stuck me? Oh, okay. Okay. That, that's really? all right. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> 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 I want to just let it come up. Yeah, we'll let it drop. Yeah, we'll let it drop. Uh, okay, all right. So, well, I sit down there. Yeah. Okay. Will you enter Mystery Challenger and sign in, please? <laughs> all right. The audience is laughing. <laughs> Would you be considered a comedian? Yeah. You know what? Somebody in mind? I think it's Phyllis Diller. <laughs> you think <laughs> right. <laughs> what is comedy? Well, comedy is anything that makes a person laugh. I laugh a lot. I laugh all day long. Uh, in fact, uh, adults should laugh more than they do. They they become so serious. Children laugh 400 times a day. Adults maybe 20, if if that. But adults should uh, make reason to laugh. My very first images of comedy were, of course, radio. Uh, actually, radio became a reality during my youth. I was born before radio, <laughs> which I find fascinating. And I remember when you had to put he headphones on to listen to radio, or it came out of a big, big bell. And then when radio really got its legs, is the first time I became aware of professional comedy like Amos and Andy and the, the old sitcom type shows, uh, Fibber, McGee, and Molly, and uh, the early shows. But the, one of the first comedy shows that really got to me was the Bob Hope at Once a Week show. I believe it was Colgate that backed him and uh, Toothpaste. And, <laughs> I, I was a mad fan of Bob Hope as a teenager, never realizing that I would get to not only meet him, but become a bosom buddy. My first dealing with comedy was on a personal level. I used it as a not-too-good-looking teenager to protect myself against tyranny because I use comedy as a protection, because when you're a teenager, you, you want to be beautiful, you want to be queen of the May, you want to have the right clothes and, and the right hair and the right everything, and you don't. And all teenagers want to look alike, of course. I started looking very different early, and I used comedy as a protection. Uh, I said it before they could say it. So I, I was born with a sense of humor, and my folks were both had a sense of humor, and I grew up in a, the right kind of home to become a comic. It was just natural. It, it, it wasn't even my idea to become a comic. It was my husband's idea. Sherwood Diller, for two years, nagged me to become a comic, and I said, now you see these children here. He said, well, send them home. I said, we can't. They're ours. Five children. Didn't stop his ideas. But I kept saying, well, what, what about these children here, you know? And he kept saying, you got to become a comic. You, you, you are a comic. So one day I said, okay. And then I started thinking, how does one become a comic? I, at that time, had a job outside the home, a daytime job. I was a copywriter at a radio station, and I called the Red Cross. I said, I have a show. Where would you like it? And they sent me to the Presidio in San Francisco, which was an army hospital. And I went there and did a show. My first show was for four guys 
in bed, not with each other. Just four guys in four beds, and they pushed a piano in the room, and that was my first show. I know that when I started, I was on the West Coast and known as an offbeat comic, which was a down put. The Easterners thought they had it, you know, that from the mountains and, the, you know, the old uh, vaudeville and the mountains and that, 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 those New York comics, they thought, oh, well, anything that other than, uh, than we is lesser. And here was a new breed called Offbeat, which included uh, Elaine May and Mike Nichols and uh, me, Shelley Berman, uh, Bob Newhart, a different type of comedy. Uh, it was less clowny, a little more uh, cerebral. Because, you know, Elaine May and Mike Nichols were so cerebral, they were far out. They had to have a very special, uh, highbrow audience. And a lot of the comics were considered, uh, but they meant it as a put down, the Easterners. But then first thing you know, we sort of had our own group that became the group and was a sort of a new look at comedy. Bob Hope heard about me and found out about me on The Tonight Show way years ago with Jack Parr and wanted to see my work in person and he came to a Washington DC club and saw me bomb. I did a very bad show. There were, uh, I didn't do a bad show. I, ha I was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong audience and there was, wouldn't be anything I could do about it except to go out because uh, I'd signed a contract. I was sent to the wrong place by the agency. And I had an audience of hookers and salesmen. And here I am talking about little kids in the household and cooking and ironing and they couldn't care less. However, Bob, with his brilliant mind, saw a professional doing a, a good show, not paying a bit of attention to the bad audience, not going after them, you know, a, a lousy comic will start knocking the audience. Did the professional show and, and left <laughs> and tried to get out without meeting him because I was so embarrassed. He grabbed me on my way, trying to sneak out, and said, you are great. And that was the turning point of my career because it was sort of at the beginning. Well, working with Bob Hope was like working at the top because Bob... It wasn't work. Uh, God, he really knew how to handle it. It was always playtime, always fun time, and he was one take Bob. Like to get, because that's comedy. Because you, you, the second time it just isn't the same. Third time it's even less. And some people love to rehearse, but uh, Bob nor I are nuts about rehearsing. Just get it right. Uh, my theory is that all co musicians are comics and that all comics are musicians. And I have a list of names in my desk drawer to prove it. M mo most of the big comics are fabulous musicians. Uh, there's, a, there was, there's a reason. It has to do with listening and the ear and timing. Without timing, a, a comedian is not a, going to be a good comedian or a comic or anything funny. You just have to hear it. There's absolutely no thrill like hearing thousands of people laugh at the same time. It's like conducting a symphony. It's that exciting or maybe more exciting, I think. Uh, the most excitement in my life has been hearing those huge laughs in huge audiences and it, it is so wonderful. And it is power. And it is a feeling of power. And I never realized that until the last years. What a wonderful power. What a great, wonderful thing. And uh, you use their energy, your audience. 
and and the, the more with them you are, the more power you have. And of course, it's their power you are using. It's you and they, and and and, and it, it is a wonderful thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. How do you like my legs? <laughs> I'm so sick of having bird legs. You know, I was in an elevator the other day, and some ugly broad looked at me, and she said, the last time I saw a leg like that, there was a message attached. <laughs> Give me any of your back mumble, you, you, you monster. Oh, you're different. I knew it wouldn't be the same that you'd play a different game cause you're different. <laughs> you're different. Well, people say, how do, you, how do you have longevity? How can you live long and healthfully? And my answer is... A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. That's a line in the Bible. They've known it that long, that laughs will keep you alive. Well, what about uh, George Burns, who lived to be over 100, uh, Bob Hope, who lived to be 100, and uh, Milton Berle, 96, and all these old, 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 old. They live for you, can't kill them. <laughs> Keep laughing. 50% of the people listed in the great book, Who's Who, meaning they did something wonderful, changed careers midstream. That's good to know. That, 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 that to become great enough to get into Who's Who, they had to have the guts to actually give, some, give up a short thing and take off on something that was new. So I urge everyone to know that it's never too late to start a comedy career. I, th I can think of two comics who started late in life. They were both salesmen, which makes sense. Uh, one was, a, mm, not going to be able to think of his name. Uh, I remember distinctly what he did. He used to sell something on the road, and he had this great talent of closing one eye very close, very very slowly, right during a story. <laughs> like, I can't think of his name for so long ago. And the other one was Rodney Dangerfield. Had been a salesman for 18 years. And boy, what a comic he was. King of the one-liners. Like if you're in a restaurant business, or any business, you must have standards, quality standards. Uh, I There are just simply... I think the main rules were never go after the audience, never blame the audience. Uh, from the very start, if I had a show that was less than what I thought was the best I could do at the time, or there was a glitch or something that bothered me, uh, I, I, a lot of young comics would come off, blame the audience, or even blame them while they're on. No! Come off and say, now, where did I go wrong? What did I do that wasn't right? You've got to start with you in most all things. If you keep blaming somebody, blaming somebody else, you'll never get any better. If you're a born comic, you can be taught more. You can be taught technique, but you can't be taught to how to be funny. You, you've got to be a born comic. You've got to be born to be funny. Uh, I don't know how, how to put this. You have to, you can't be taught timing. Uh, the worst thing in the world is f f when some director says count to three. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and actually I lived through some of that. Most comics are uh, held back by lack of material. And that's when they fall into the use of, uh, of dirty words or shock words, because they'll know they'll get a laugh, a cheap laugh, but it isn't a real laugh. Uh, you, you, need, you need to get go for laughs from your material. Uh, material, material, material. You've got to work on your, on your show. And uh, the, in my case, you should make some rules when you start out to be. My, one of my first rules, don't show off, entertain. 
uh, if you know how to sing or play this or that and the other, forget it. If, you're, if you want to be a comic, do something to make them laugh. Don't try to impress them with how bright you are, how wonderful you are. Get the laughs. Uh, the other thing is, I had a rule. I wanted to appeal to everyone from three to 103. In other words, I wanted everybody. And I, I managed that. Children liked me because of the way I dressed and looked in the hair and the silly boots and the hat and the laughs. So I had little kids and uh, old people and everybody in between. I had a, you have to go for you have to make yourself rules for you. And if you don't have any rules, you may go astray. A hunger for being a comic won't, won't do it. No, there's more to it than that. You can want it very badly, but that doesn't mean that you're able to do it. <laughs> Be, even being hungry won't, it'll help. <laughs> you want a hungry comic, a guy who's willing to work. I am truly honored and flattered by the attention that so many of our great female comics give me credit for making it look believable, possible, uh, even respectable. <laughs> but I, I would like to encourage any young lady or guy to try comedy. First you have to try. You have to, it would be nice to know that you have it and you have to do it and then you go and do it. But there are some people who have stayed with it, say stand-up comedy, and suffering through eight years of not doing it and, and, and working hard and never really, in other words, it's a good thing to know if you have it or you don't. But I would encourage everyone who feels that they want to do it, it's a marvelous, thing to do. Well, you know, I haven't given up. I know you look at me, you think I've given up. I have not. I was today at the beauty parlor four times. They wouldn't let me in. <laughs> Makes me so mad. I confronted him today. I said, look, you've been putting all this expensive stuff on my face all these years. Why don't I get better looking? He said, you've built up an immunity. <laughs> told me about sex, she figured with my looks I'd never get that far. <laughs> you ought to see Fang's mother in a bikini. <laughs> she was swimming off the coast of Florida and two Navy planes identified her as Cuba. <laughs> it's very important that comedy becomes known as an art and an art form rather than just comedy because believe me a fine artist in comedy I'm thinking of people like Sid Caesar Carol Burnett these genius people who are just they exude comedy uh, you, you 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 laugh and you love and uh, it, it's it's just a marvelous thing that you're going to have a, a Hall of Fame, uh, bringing it in uh, to the realization that it is an art. Uh, the worse things are, the more you need comedy to lighten it. There comes a point where I simply don't read the news because it's bad, or I don't listen to the news because it's bad. And I can't change it, but I can get laughs. I can make somebody feel better if I can make them laugh and relieve the tension. Because a lot of people take drugs to relieve the tension. And you, you shouldn't let uh, such distress get to you personally. All you can do is keep yourself happy. I would like to be remembered as a good stand-up comic who
who, whose ambition was to get as many laughs as possible with as few words as possible. In other words, I like to edit it right down to the bone where it's a little talk, a lot of laughter, a little talk, a lot of laughter. I, I just don't want to be known as a blabbermouth. What's the first thing you do when you have to wash clothes? Fix a drink? That's what I do. But most women start by sorting. Whites here, tub fast colors, synthetics and blends, wash and wear cottons. Yuck. That's what you do if you use a chlorine bleach. And if you're nine years behind in your washing like I am, that sorting takes a lot of time. You'd be much better off with snowy bleach. It doesn't have any chlorine in it, so you don't need to do all that extra sorting. Just separate the whites from the tub fast colors. Anything that's safe in your automatic is safe in snowy bleach. Of course, you still have to keep dogs and kids out of the washer. <laughs> Uh, uh, Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. Oh, I love Scooby-Doo. I love all that stuff. You know, kiddie stuff is good stuff. Oh, yeah. It goes yeah. on. You can watch it forever. Yeah, that's know. right. It's, it's classic. It's forever. It has no boundaries, no barriers, nothing. So, so thank you for making my children laugh. Oh, well. Tell them hello. Thank you on behalf of mankind. Ah, uh, bless your heart. Mountain. Bless you. Well, I'm the one who had the great time. You're through with me, aren't we're, you? We're done, man. Good. Okay. Let's have a few laughs. <laughs>